Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a delightfully animal-free Florida Wednesday. I haven't seen the cats. I haven't seen the goats. Uh, the birds that have been haranguing me don't seem to be in the trees at the moment. So I have peace, quiet, and loveliness. Uh, the temperature, eh, you know, it's not hot yet, but it will be. Supposedly, it's going to be a little cooler this weekend, which is fine. Uh, but again, I feel like we've been robbed of the little nippy cold weather spells that we're supposed to get this time of year. And uh, have just had, uh, you know, a gradually increasing warmer series of days that are going to lead into the revulsion, the miserable hot summers that, uh, that I just can't stand. And someday I hope to avoid completely. Completely, but eh, for the moment I'm stuck here. I hear the Kubota little tractor starting up over there. Peter must be heading out to feed the goats. Um, I don't know where they are, but hopefully they stay where they are and not come up here. Uh, today I have this 1978 Lincoln Mark V. Uh, now I know I've done a Lincoln Mark V recently. I want to say about two or three months ago. Uh, but frankly, this is a better example and one that I'd rather show. If you remember that one had 20 inch wheels and uh, was a nice driver, but um, eh, you know, it wasn't what I wanted it to be, but it was the only Mark V I had at the time. Uh, I also wasn't putting still photos over the videos at that point, so I didn't really get to uh, explore the history in a giant one and a half hour long video that there's the bird he is back <sighs> shit anyway we'll see if he goes away uh, I didn't get to explore the mark the way I would have wanted to, but I'm going to, you know, eh, yeah, the 40 minute videos, I, I wish I could shorten them out again, but they're happening organically. So I've got to try and cut down on my rambling to uh, keep them at a normal clip. Uh, so we'll just get right into this car. Uh, the, uh, all right. So this is the Mark V. Uh, that implies that there were four cars that uh, were predecessors to this one. And yeah, essentially that's true. Uh, although the uh, Mark One, well, I don't know. Well, we'll get into it. So anyway, the Continental started in the late 30s because Edsel Ford wanted something to he wanted something nice to drive on his vacation in Florida. So he contacted his design team, said, "Come up with something." Uh, they ended up making what was then the first Continental, based on the uh, Zephyr platform, which uh, was very attractive. And they shipped it down to Edsel Ford in Florida. He loved it. Uh, his friends loved it. He wrote back saying he could sell. A thousand of them uh, if they made them so they decided to go ahead and make them which they did so there was a 1940 Continental which ran through I want to say 1948 uh, they were v12 powered and they were considered some of the most attractive cars of their day uh, what's his name that architect Frank Lloyd Wright said it was the most attractive car he'd ever seen and he backed it up because he bought two of them so uh, it was uh, frankly a good-looking car very collectible today v12 powered and uh, rode all the way for eight model years. At that stage, the Mark went away, and then Ford decided that they wanted to come up with another one in the 50s to compete with, you know, Cadillac was doing uh, that uh, big uh, expensive Coupe de Ville. Uh, the European stuff was getting expensive and was showing up on these shores. So uh, they made the Mark II, uh, which, uh, you know, on paper, it was the successor to the original Continental. Uh, the Mark II also helped distinguish it from the Bentley Continental under that name, which was, of course, a fine car. Uh, but it was, again, its own Mark. Continental was slotted well above Ford. And the Mark II was insanely expensive, like a hundred grand in today's dollars. It was on par with the Rolls-Royce offerings at the time. And uh, they sold not that many of them. Uh, they were essentially hand-built. Uh, they had every single option you could imagine, with the exception of air conditioning. That was the only thing that could be added. And uh, I want to say less than 3,000 eventually ended up being made and sold, which makes them uh, fairly collectible today, but uh, commercially they were not a success. Fast forward a few more years and Ford brings the Continental name out again uh, and makes a series of 
marks that were unbeloved by people. Uh, they came out, and I want to say then it was 1958. Actually, it wasn't a few more years. 57 was the last model of the Mark II. Uh, there was a Continental in 58, but it was now Lincoln-based, and uh, so were the uh, the Mark series. And uh, 58, 59, 60 saw a Mark III, IV, and V, uh, which frankly are not beloved by Ford people and are considered sort of the fake marks of the time. Uh, they sold okay, but uh, not great, and were discontinued. Uh, they, they, you know, for, the Continental has to be one of the most convoluted uh, names in all of automotive history because a whole variety of cars were sold under the Continental name. And, they, you know, it, at first it was its own brand, then it was a model name, and uh, it becomes very hard to sort of touch base and keep up with it. It really, really does. But we're going to fast forward a few years to Lee Iacocca whose success with the Mustang put him in charge of basically all of Ford's cars and light trucks. He was uh, uh, the uh, top dog vice president, uh, flies are coming back, uh, reporting directly to uh, Henry Ford too. So uh, he decided that he wanted the Continental to come back and he wanted a two-door car, a two-door luxury car to compete uh, with the Eldorado and with some of the other personal luxury stuff that was coming out. Uh, so he came up with this idea called to his designer in the middle of the night, I can't remember the guy's name, and said, man, put a Rolls-Royce grill on a Thunderbird and uh, put a spare tire hump in the back. <laughs> and the engineer is like, oh, God, nobody's doing that shit now. It's long gone. But uh, when Lee Iacocca asked you to do it, you do it. So he did it. And uh, the car actually became quite a success. Uh, in fact, Henry Ford, too, loved it. He green-lighted the project right away off the clay models. And that car would be become the Lincoln Continental Mark III, uh, which indeed did look a little bit like a Thunderbird with a Rolls-Royce grill. Uh, but the, you know, the people liked it. They bought it. It was uh, considered a pretty neat car. Uh, they built it on the Thunderbird sedan platform so it could have a longer uh, stretched out uh, front end and, you know, look very imposing going down the road. Uh, that Mark III sold pretty well and then became the Mark IV also sharing a platform with the Ford Thunderbird. And, uh, you know, that uh, the styling of that car kind of missed the mark, no pun intended. Uh, it, um, it had some curves in it that, uh, I, you know, t were not really beloved. Still not a bad-looking car, still desirable, but uh, it was just missing something. And enter Don De La Rosa, uh, a designer, who got the nod to make the Mark V, and he did, and it's this car. And it addressed everything that was theoretically wrong with the Mark IV. Uh, and uh, it came out in 1977 and was a smash hit. Uh, and there's a few things going on at that time that kind of contributed to that. Uh, number one, you had the gas crisis. You had the Shah of Iran. You had Jimmy Carter and his approval rating sinking. You had all the car companies downsizing. Uh, GM had basically downsized all of their big cars for 1977. Uh, Chrysler essentially essentially downsized them all for 78, and Ford alone decided to keep the big car thing rolling, and then kind of a, you know, middle finger to the way the world was going. This, this Mark V, was the longest coupe ever produced by the Ford Motor Company. Uh, it was upsized from the Mark IV, and it was done in the middle of the gas crisis and emissions crunch and safety stuff and everything else that was contributing to cars getting smaller at the time. Time. It was a complete uh, turnaround from what, what should have been happening. They, instead of getting smaller, they made this car bigger. Uh, and that uh, that just sort of worked against what Ford had. And, uh, well, not what Ford had. They, they obviously wanted it bigger, but what the country was looking for at the time. And man, it sold like hotcakes. They made like 240,000 of these things over three years uh, for, for good reason. Absolutely good reason. Uh, so anyway, while well, this car was the antithesis of everything that was happening with downsizing in the late 70s and the malaise era, uh, it did incorporate just about every feature that the personal luxury coupe segment loved at the time. It was a very, very popular segment. Uh, all of the two-door personal luxury coupes 
were selling quite well. Uh, the Monte Carlo on the lower end, the Cordoba, uh, the Coupe de Ville, the El Dorado, and uh, a variety of other stuff, the Dodge Magnum or the Chrysler Mag, I don't remember which Mark made it then, but uh, there was just a host of personal luxury coupes. You remember Herb Tarlick on WKRP, he drove a Cordoba. Uh, Jack Ewing on Damas, he drove uh, one of these cars, this Mark 7, Mark 5, I did it again. Uh, you know, Barnaby Jones, TV detectives, that sort of thing. Uh, all of that. I think Perry Mason had a Lincoln as well. Uh, Matlock later on had a Crown Vic. I guess he was supposed to be more modest. But uh, anyway, uh, it was a wildly popular car in TV and movies at the time. You would have seen it on all sorts of shows. And uh, and, and because, frankly, it had an incredible amount of style, Dolorosa really knocked it out of the park when he squared off and sharpened uh, the lines of the Mark IV. It had these giant slab-sided fenders uh, with uh, extensions at the front with lights in them, the rolls Royce Grill continued from the Mark III. Uh, it, it had a series of designer editions, uh, Pucci and uh, Bill Blass and, uh, you know, some... Spe Man, this car was so customizable. Uh, this one, this Wedgwood Blue car was surely part of a luxury package, Wedgwood Blue, where you could go in and order the car with all the colors you wanted or didn't want, interiors you wanted or didn't want, uh, quarter top trim, impact today, all sorts of stuff. You could make these cars how you wanted them, and uh, a lot of people did, and that's why there's so many variations out on the road today. Uh, and uh, very few were exactly alike, which is quite interesting, and it's just something that doesn't happen today because of the way the corporate world works in car sales. Uh, you know, Toyota brought in the idea that there might be two or three different interior colors, even though in the 70s, by the way, uh, the Japanese makers were doing all the bling to try and keep up with the American sales. Uh, the 280ZX had the most decadent and revolting car ad of the Malaise era, uh, which uh, uh, the black gold edition. If you ever bored, look that up. It's ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, you know, like the Cressida, the um, I, I can't remember, the Maxima, all these cars were sort of very blingy to try and keep up with the Americans. And it was just fun stuff. Uh, but anyway, this car was available in a variety of different design, uh, designer colors and options. And uh, some of the designer options were 9000 bucks over the uh, base price. It was real money. Uh, but gone were the curves, in were the uh, straight edges. They enlarged the quarter windows in the back. They kept the opera windows, which, again, people liked. Uh, they put vents in the sides, which are functional. Uh, they kept the spare tire hump. Uh, the five mile an hour bumpers started to look a little bit more integrated, I think in part because of those bumper fillers over the top of them that made them look smaller. And uh, they became pretty damn good looking cars that fit the times very, very well. Uh, they were lower than the previous car and longer than the previous car. The roof line was flat and uh, they just ended up being attractive. And the Thunderbird by the time uh, 77 was no longer based on the Lincoln platform. The 76 Thunderbird was. Uh, it was a big luxury coupe. Uh, the 77, and we did a video on that, was now uh, smaller based on the Ford Elite. A lot of people think it's based on the same platform as this because it looks similar, uh, but it frankly wasn't. It was a smaller, lighter car, uh, as was this. They got under the 5,000 pound mark and got it 400 pounds lighter than the Mark IV, which I suppose helped with gas mileage a little bit. So uh, anyway, let's just get into this one. So you've got the Continental hump in the back, the spare tire hump, obviously long since it housed a spare tire, but uh, does contain the styling. Uh, you see this has twice pipes. It does have the dual exhaust option, which is nice. Uh, originally, these taillights were supposed to curve around and go into the top of the rear quarter panel, but apparently focus groups hated that, so they uh, did away with it. And uh, you got those big reflectors on the uh, trunk lid and the chrome trim all around and the Mark V with the Lincoln emblem. You know, all very nice. Uh, all right, let's get into this. So, 
So we've got the two key system, which I've going on about how much I love it, and I do. And uh, here we have a very nicely finished trunk. Uh, now, because the guy who had this showed it, he made up this thing to, uh, you know, display it with, which, eh, whatever, it's fine. Uh, Dalton cleaned the trunk, didn't bother finding the correct stow point for the jack and uh, tools, probably underneath that space saver spare somewhere, but, you know, why bother when you can just go on and play on Instagram or something? Uh, also has this nice box with five different uh, shop manuals covering uh, the chassis, the engine, uh, the electrical system, uh, what else, the body, and so on and so forth. Nice that that's all with the car if you're going to be doing your own maintenance, although the internet probably has all that stuff now, so it's not really necessary, but still nice to see it with the car. Uh, a good sized trunk, you could fit a lot of crap in, and uh, everything lovely under there. Have a look under the hood. Look at the length of that thing. I mean, it's like the front end's in a different time zone from the rear. Let's see if I can do this one-handed. Yeah, not bad. And those springs are still pretty good. Uh, so I'd say that it's good this has the 460 option, and it certainly is, but uh, pretty much every 77 and 78 that wasn't built in California did. It was just a lot of value added for the money. Uh, you know, the base 400 had 179 horsepower. This 460 had 208, uh, plus a lot more torque, and really helped motivate the car down the road. Um, it made it to a C6 uh, automatic, a very good automatic transmission, 9-inch Ford rear end, an exceptional rear end, and a four-wheel disc brake standard. I mean, it reads like a hot rod list from the 80s. I mean, this is what people wanted, 9-inch uh, Ford disc brake, C6, and 460. Uh, so a true factory hot rod, at least as far as statistics go, four-barrel carburetor. And uh, on this particular example, everything nice and original under there, you see the a, a sticker with the uh, emissions info still on the uh, uh, the valve cover, still the Ford uh, 460 4V uh, decal on the air cleaner and all of the other stickers and such uh, where they're supposed to be. So everything nice and proper under the incredibly long hood on this. Also in 78, they widened the radiator for better cooling and did a few little tweaks here and there which uh, theoretically helped the car out. So nice stuff all around. Get that back down. Uh, hidden headlights, I'm an absolute sucker for. Uh, let's see those popped up and see how they look. This does have the uh, automatic headlight stuff, but there's the warning buzzer. We'll get in there's some neat stuff with the warning buzzer. There you go. So those doors would come up. Uh, they could also be clipped into place. People, I don't, you know, I think by this time the lights were actually pretty dependable, but earlier Mark series, the vacuum systems were really crappy, so a lot of people just clipped them up and were done with them. They're tough to keep going now. Uh, but anyway, I love pop-up headlights. Uh, you can see this one because it has the high beam dimmer option, has a uh, sensor here in between the driver's side lights that uh, detects oncoming cars so it will uh, dim the high beams. Uh, I love the way the grill continues down beneath the bumper and runs behind it there. It just looks very nice to me. And these uh, protrusions from the parking lamps, which light up at night, uh, very, very cool stuff and uh, attractive to look at, even like the little bumperettes. I'm going to back the car up to try and, I don't know if the sun stole back there it is. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pull, uh, pull back, get all my crap in the car and pull back up into the shaded area there. So uh, give me a second and we'll get that done. All right, feeling better and getting my stuff at the trunk. Uh, I'm ready to hit the road when we go. Uh, now, this car has a few options on it, which I quite like, and were obviously part of that luxury package. Uh, would not at all be for a surprise to find this was a special order car. Uh, I was thinking about sending away for the Marty Report. You know, the fellow I bought it from, very, very nice guy, bought another car from us. We got into a conversation. He said he had this and was running out of storage, so uh, opportunistically, I jumped in. <laughs> and bought the car. 
and uh, you know, uh, YouTube, one of our watchers, a subscriber, nice guy, and uh, hopefully he enjoys seeing his Lincoln being highlighted here. Uh, but anyway, the order of this car was quite nice. The um, uh, I'm going to get a Marty report, I was saying. It's a thing you can, okay, yeah, look, before I make promises, it takes like uh, two or three weeks for the thing to come in, so uh, I don't know if I'm going to order it or still have it. I, I don't, I'm not making any promises here, so maybe. I'll let you know if you decide to call and buy this car. Uh, but anyway, the um, uh, quarter top uh, was a, actually an option, although it appeared on virtually every one. And if you didn't want it, uh, you could uh, delete it, but only by special order, uh, at least in 77 and 78. In 79, you could no longer delete it. It was just always going to be there. Uh, also, that chrome strip on the bottom, uh, these uh, simulated wire wheel covers uh, were up standard from the factory cover, and then you could opt on to different alloy wheels above that. Uh, the uh, opera windows, nice chrome surrounds. Uh, it had a feature where when you pulled the door handle, the lights went on. This was all big stuff back then. It's all really standard now, but at the time it was serious. And uh, one of my favorite things about this car is that it came with this fantastic box of eight tracks. Uh, I've already kept my George Jones. You see, I've still got that here. I'm not getting rid of that for anything. Uh, but now I've added it to a bunch of other stuff. We've got the best of the doors, Deep Purple, the Guess Who, you know, Hall and Oates, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, it's like a laundry list of singer-songwriters from the 70s, which was, of course, a great time for that sort of thing. Uh, gone are the talented cats of that era and in their place God knows what today I really honestly God knows what so we're gonna put that in there for uh, cruising as we're driving get that back down uh, have a look inside. Uh, this also has the big sunroof option, which is quite nice. And to my amazement, it works and works well. I was terrified to open it at first. Okay, inside, this has the crushed velour. Very, very nice. You could also, of course, get leather. Uh, we've got the remnants of the... Uh, plastic that covered the seats when it came new. Uh, the leather's uh, got little buttons in it that look nice, or the velour, sorry, I should say. Uh, it's a split bench seat with dual power on each side. Uh, you know, very good luxury options in this car, and quite a few of them were standard. Uh, it's got acres of fake wood trim everywhere. It's got a tilt wheel. Uh, and uh, anyway, we'll get into all that stuff as we go. Uh, this ashtray is used by the rear passengers. Nice stuff. If you have a couple of Canadians back there with a smoking habit, they'll be able to put their cigarettes out. And I don't know if you'll be able to hear the click when I open the door, but let's try it. Yeah, do you hear that little click? Uh, what that does was actually release this locking mechanism here with the door open. Uh, when the door is closed, that's locked in place. Uh, when the door is open, it releases the mechanism as though you had flicked the little handle and you can move the seats forward for easier loading. Uh, again, your Canadians are going to be intensely chipper in the back. Uh, this is a six-passenger coupe, which I guess it better be for being 20 feet long. And, uh, you know, the rear is just expansive of crush velour and padded seating. You can see all the door panels are nice and tight. I love the little lights built in over the opera windows and uh, everything just sort of proper and nice back there. Also, of course, three-point safety belts, which were a deal uh, in the late 70s. Uh, door panel nice, you've got your window controls here, your power door locks, your mirror, and uh, your seat controls. And uh, Ford has its own little Mark V uh, plaque on the skid plate, so uh, let's hop in and fire this thing on. Okay, now this is cool. I'm going to show you this right now. Uh, we've got a warning buzzer for when the key's in. Here it is. Okay, now when I put the ignition on, I'm also going to get the fasten belts warning buzzer, which is different, but at a higher pitch, and they harmonize really nicely. So, have a listen for that. Here we go. Key buzzer. Ah, and listen to that lovely stereo sound, now adding the fasten belts buzzer. Very, very cool. I believe in the Diamond Jubilee Edition, which was very expensive. It had some sort of a chime, uh, but that was, uh, you know, that was standard only on that car, which cost uh, significantly more than a base mark. So, fire this thing up. 
nice. So, uh, good smooth running 460 cube V8, big block under the hood, uh, everything you could possibly want in a personal luxury coupe at the time, uh, short of another 150 horsepower. Uh, you've got these uh, twin gauges, uh, crystal cut glass as they called it. You've got a Cartier chronometer, apparently you could call it a clock because maybe it had a second hand. Uh, also had the uh, day and date, which I haven't bothered to set and I probably won't. Uh, also like the Roman numerals. Uh, here you see it has automatic on and dimming headlight control, automatic climate control, which was standard. In fact, we'll get the AC on. It works good in this car and uh, it's starting to get a little bit tepid uh, outside. You've got your PRND indicator in the center in a vertical way. And uh, you've got uh, a uh, 80 mile an hour speedometer there to the uh, to the right. Uh, you've also got your unleaded fuel only, or um, yeah, of course by then it was starting to be all that stuff. Uh, your fuel gauge, and this is a shame. This is a very expensive option at the time, and the first use of a digital display for a mechanical function in a car, as far as I know. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not working. It looks like the uh, uh, the screen got blacked out. But that would use a convoluted system where it measured. Uh, uh, back pressure and vacuum to determine how many miles you had to empty and that did away with the fuel warning light the low fuel light uh, shame it's not on but and eh, what are you gonna do uh, wipers and washers the world's most enormous lighter oh, for the love of God how many phone calls in one minute he can wait too all right Ah, uh, you know, I've done that now with the stupid iPhone. Every time you want to shut off the ringer, uh, I end up taking a picture of the call. I don't know why, because I'm pinching the two sides. So I have like 50 pictures of people calling me. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm tough. Phones are getting worse. It was a lot easier when I had a StarTac. Uh, I love this. This is a... Uh, four speaker quadrasonic tape deck, uh, AM stereo and FM. Uh, let see, we've got a power antenna, which I believe is still working. Come on, I know it is. I saw it work earlier. There it is going down. Oh, this is actually a very appropriate song because I think he talks about having a, uh, a true baby blue continental. Maybe he meant Wedgwood blue. We'll see if we can find that in there. Yeah, there we go. There's the antenna. All right. I'll wait for that. Uh, anyway, you've got a, an ashtray down here. Nice stuff. Uh, you've got uh, more continental wood trim with chrome piping. Uh, here in the glove box, you got uh, an original owner's manual and an emergency uh, Credence 8-track uh, uh, if you need it. You also have a trunk release. Um, up here, uh, you've got uh, vanity mirrors inside, and they're the stupid, <laughs> stupid, and I just fell out. I have to glue that in, probably. Uh, give it a break, it's a 78 model. And uh, also over here on the passenger side, those are staying in fine, nice. And uh, here is this big, fast moving, beautifully working power sunroof. Love it, I really couldn't believe that. Nah, the hell with it. That would have been nice timing to talk about the Continental. Uh, but anyway, you've got uh, these cool little vent windows as well. So you run the window down, it starts with the vent window, and then continues on to the main window. You could call that the smoker's window, actually. Uh, if you leave that up and leave that down, uh, you have a nice place to ash your cigarettes in the 70s while your lady friend in hot pants and roller skates is sitting in the passenger seat next to you. Uh, and uh, plenty of room for the smoke to escape out of the uh, large power sunroof. Lovely. All right, let's go for a spin. Uh, this one also had cruise control. And then this uh, Ford style tilt wheel that, uh, it, it, to me, it hinges too far back. I've always felt that about Ford wheels. This one isn't as bad as the ones from the 80s that like hinged right behind the wheel. Uh, but uh, it's still, I don't know, I don't like it to hinge further forward. But you can put this thing in true low rider position uh, where you basically have the steering wheel between your legs. 
Right, look at that enormous expansive hood out front. I mean, it just never ends. It keeps going and going and going. Uh, you've got the creases from the fenders on either side and, you know, the V in the middle. I, I mean, what is going on with the goddamn phone? Let's put that on airplane mode. Um, and the Lincoln emblem as well at the end. All very, very nice stuff. Uh, Dalton, by the way, this car came in so clean. He was so happy that uh, he didn't really have to detail it much. And I suspect when we turn, even the windshield is going to be far better than uh, what we normally get. Yeah, he could have touched it up a little better. You see, it's still got a little bit of a haze on the inside. But this guy who cleaned the windshield probably six months ago, it's cleaner than Dalton's offerings from yesterday. Dalton's <laughs> offerings. I mean... Oh, God. Anyway, um, I'm like feathering the throttle, and the torque is more than enough to get the car up and moving. Uh, good tires on this car, which is nice. They're not old, so I don't have to feel terrified that it's got 40-year-old tires on it. Uh, 47,000 original miles on the clock. Uh, when I got in it this morning, I was amazed that all of the... Um, uh, the interior lighting, the gauge cluster lighting, all that stuff worked perfect. Uh, it was beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's just something you don't see in these old cars so much. Uh, not all of them feel like time machines where, you know, they're almost like you'd feel what a real example was at the time. Not restored or polished or brought back, but uh, what a true car would have felt like in the context of the years that it was made. And this car does have that vibe. Uh, I could feel like I just drive it like I would any car, like I'm just transported back to the 70s and, you know, I've got uh, a deep V chest hair thing going with gold chains and I'm out cruising around the discos looking for action, so uh, it just puts you right into that mode. Uh, the car does have front and rear sway bars. Uh, hard to imagine that it handles any worse. So God knows what the sway bars actually do. Uh, if they're tightening it up, I'd hate to know what the car was like without them. So uh, you get a lot of body roll, obviously. Let's see if we get into the secondaries a little bit. Now, it doesn't give you that big woo-woo like you get in the Chevys. I don't know why. Uh, must have a big silencer under the hood or something. Uh, but going down the road, you've got over-assisted power steering, you've got over-assisted brakes, you've got over-assisted everything, you've got climate control, you've got, uh, in fact, I'm going to put this George Jones in again. Let's see if I can find it here. That's just my go-to 8-track for cruising. Kept her picture on his board. Yeah, you know, I mean, what a fantastic way to drive around with <laughs> Absolutely love it. I could do this all day. Cold air conditioning, you know, two-finger steering, uh, brakes you barely have to touch, uh, gliding down the road on this cushy pillow ride, uh, listening to proper uh, uh, 70s George Jones music. You just can't do any better than this. You really, really can't. Um, so, I, you know, was it a driver's car? I guess at the time, maybe. I don't think it was considered a good handling car. Uh, certainly, it must have considered a powerful car in terms of having all those cubes. But, um, uh, you know, coming out of the 70s, it wouldn't have felt that impressive. It would have felt very malaise era uh, with horsepower ratings, you know, plummeted even lower than Jimmy Carter's approval ratings. So, uh, it is, uh, it's a product of its time. Uh, many consider it the last graduate, this is in air quotes here, the last graduate of the old school, the last true full-frame dinosaur from the big three. And uh, I suppose that's accurate. I mean, there was nothing bigger at the time, and uh, nothing bigger came out after it. Now, the Continental two-door, the... Uh, you know, what you would think of as a town car, although it wasn't in 78, 79. Uh, the two-door version of that was actually longer, uh, but it was technically considered a sedan, part of the Continental sedan lineup. So uh, this is the longest coupe uh, made by Ford, uh, you know, till, I don't know if anything came, I can't imagine a car came out later on that was longer than this. So I presume it still remains the longest coupe ever made by Ford. And uh, man, you feel it. 
they really do in every square inch of this thing. It's a big sucker, uh, but it drives nice. It drives nice, and they sold a bunch of them with good reason. And uh, you know, while the Republicans and the conservative types went out and bought Cadillacs, uh, the people who liked a little bit of bling and show and pizzazz, uh, they went for the Mark V. And uh, it's really starting to come into its own now uh, on the collector market. You get a really nice example for considerably and comparably cheap money, but they've been tracking upward. So uh, don't wait too long. They're going to get more expensive, at least the real nice ones. Anyway, so there it is. I'm sorry for this convoluted review. Probably too much coronavirus whiskey this morning. Uh, it's just, you know, I still don't feel like it's gone away, so I want to keep protecting myself. And uh, I find the uh, whiskey therapy to be more trustworthy than masks. You never know if you're getting a good quality mask or not. So uh, with uh, whiskey, you know what you're getting every time. And uh, it does have its impact, though, as I do these videos. Now, I, I mean, we're having a dead small drink. I'm not driving around polluted uh, just enough to get me going. I doubt I'd even tip off a breathalyzer, so, uh, so don't cry about that. But um, uh, there it is, uh, 1978 Lincoln Mark V Coupe. This one in Wedgwood Blue. Uh, very attractive car, lovely to drive. It will be for sale at Auto House of Naples, so you can give those guys a call at 239-263-8500 uh, or on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, gonna try to come up with something for tomorrow or the next day. Don't know if I will, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, otherwise, uh, hang in there and we'll have some more fun stuff to follow. Uh, take care and we'll see you with the next one.